In the meantime, there were two female um, airmen that wanted to go to Texas on leave. And since we could carry some extra people there, he said, okay, that it would be all right to take the two female passengers with us. They were both uh, E3s and they had finished their boot camp and stuff and they were gonna get their 30 day leave and we had to check them out in case we had a, an emergency in the air and stuff and uh, had to check them out in case we had a water, a water landing that he was gonna make uh, in Texas down there and what they would do if we had a, a, an emergency and things and how the life rafts would work and things. So. He said, be here at eight o'clock the next morning and we we're all gonna have a takeoff. Well, his eight o'clock takeoff was usually a, a, after he prepared breakfast and everything on the airplane and got ready to go. So we got in there <clears throat> and about 9.30 or so, we finally started to take a top, takeoff run, got airborne and we're on our way to to the Gulf of Mexico down there. And we knew it was gonna be a, so we're now airborne in a PB4Y amphib on the way to the Gulf of Mexico. And about an hour, hour and a half into the flight, we knew it was gonna be a, at least an eight to 10 hour flight and we were cruising along about 90 knots, and if we had any discrepancies come up or anything, we'd have to make an emergency landing, and so we were looking for a long time away from home. So we're airborne for the, about two hours, I had no clue as to where we were at the time over what area we were at. I knew that we were over water sometime and that we were over land at some time. And I get a, um, I'm sitting on the radio watch with a set of earphones on and just listening to the uh, bird dog. Bird dog is, you dial in two uh, radio stations and it cross sections and it tells you approximately where you are as long as you fly the beam and keeps you on course. Well, I've got a headset on and I'm listening to the music and the dinks that going on and the co-pilot is listening up in the cockpit, listening to the beams and he's got an indicator that is telling him that he's flying the beams correctly so that he can actually talk and stuff and can listen to music on the side. And I hear Pappy, Boy, Pappy uh, Burns' voice come up and he said he wants, uh, I'm trying to remember the flight engineer's name. His name was Heard first class named Heard, and he was an E6 um, maintenance guy, and Heard was not in his station, and he had another backup engineer that was there, but he was in training. The idea was to train a relief crew other than Pappy Burns, so that if we had to, and he was training the co-pilot how to fly this thing. So if we had to do it again, we would have somebody else that's qualified to go and know what was happening. They were training me as a radioman. 
we're tooling along, and, and Pappy Burns listening to the engines, and any time the engine got a little out of sync, he would want to talk to his, his uh, flight engineer to want to know why those engines weren't married up just perfect and how he could distinguish that they were out of sync and stuff we never figured out because we couldn't tell the difference. But Herb was all the way back and he had taken one of the young females back with him and apparently he had been the sponsor for the two females to get a ride and he had dated them and he was back in the rack back uh, in the back of the aircraft and was cuddled up with her. So when he, Burns demanded he get up, then he asked him where he was. He says, well, he was talking to the young ladies back there and he says, uh, I don't want any fooling around on this airplane. <laughs> and he says, I want to be able to see those two girls sitting up in near the center of the airplane because it was split up to where you they had a hump in the middle where the wings were attached and you had to go up and over that hump or hump to get into the cockpit or to get to the after end. And you could stand up and look back there and, and see through the back if they didn't close the door in between. And Burns was kind of religious, I guess, and he was not happy with his flight engineer. <laughs> and so we landed, and I'm trying to remember the station. We were halfway there, and we landed, and we what did Iran remain overnight? And we're going to finish the flight the next day. Well, he demanded that the girls get off the flight. He wasn't happy with their their conduct, but they talked, sweet talked them, and said they were they knew him and they had dated him. Yes, but they there was no funny stuff going on and everything and. So he relented, made them pledge that they'd be perfect young ladies, said a prayer with them, put them back on the airplane the next morning, and we went on down to the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> and after that, nobody wanted to fly again with Pappy Burns. <laughs> he made a, we should have made it one day, and he made it a two-day flight and he logged a godlike number of hours. So he was, when he, when he left and went back to wherever he was stationed, I never found that out because I was just a young kid. I was, I think I was just made third class then. And I had a lot of sympathies for these two young girls trying to get back home on 30 days leave. <laughs> so. And they were good looking girls. They were <laughs> nice to talk to. But that was the end of that flight. My next flight in seaplanes, they sent me to PBM school. The Navy still had PBMs flying, PBM, PBM fives. And the PBMs always carried an electrician and a radio man on board them because they seemed to have a lot of electrical malfunctions and things and you always had to make sure the batteries were fully charged and stuff. And you always had to land on water and they had to hook you up at the bow. You had to rig the bow through the bow. They had a, a storage area in the front and it had a hatch, and you could open the hatch and reach out, and they had a hook on the front of the hauser that you could hook the anchor to if you had to anchor and drop an anchor, or if you had to hook onto a buoy, then they could 
pull, tow you back into, uh, pull you, put your uh, extra wheels on the side of the airplane, which was a, uh, another big long story of how you get them on and float them out there and all that. And you always had a crew on board that you had to, if they needed, they could rig the sea anchor which was nothing more than like a, a huge umbrella that you rigged from the back and stuck out. And then if the pilot said trip it, you had a trip line that you could pull that would collapse the umbrella and you'd pull it back in. And once you went and rigged and hooked the wheels on, they could tow you up on the ramp and you became towable out of the way. But we had to go through a school to do all of that and learn it. And then I made several flights from there to Lake Washington on up the, to uh, ferry B BBMs. And then because I had seaplane experience in two different airplanes, as I progressed up the chain and I became first class, they sent me to P5M school. Uh, P5M was the latest, last version of the seaplanes that the Navy had. And instead of sea anchors and a guy dropping an umbrella out one side or the other side of the airplane in the back, they actually put movable flaps back there. And the pilot could control how far he stuck the flap out or if he put them both out, it would stop you in the water. It was just like an air uh, flap on a, a fighter plane. Once he stuck them out, you s immediately slowed down. But by sticking one side or the other side, he could turn the airplane completely around and taxi back. It, it also had attachments where you could put amphib uh, wheels on it and tow it up on the... But it had what they call sun strand units that were part of the engine, driven by the engines. And they, these were big prop engines out there. And these sun strand units would convert, took the place of the old generators and batteries and stuff. The problem with it is they had to be parallel and you had to learn how to parallel the frequencies and the load and match them together and that's why they carry an electrician aboard. And you had to go to school to learn all of that. So once I got proficient at the trainer and paralleling the engines and marrying them up and stuff, I had my first flight in it. I took off in San Diego Bay and we flew around and landed and then they brought a crew out from the East Coast that took the airplane. So I never got to fly any more in a P5M. But I had been through all the training and that was just another event that I could put on my punch card. One of the airplanes that I got acquainted with, but I didn't get actually to fly in, was the PB1W. Now, if you look that up in the Air Force language, you, you look up a B-17 bomber. And the Navy acquired several of those as weather airplanes because they had an extremely good long range and they were easy, they could, instead of bomb loads, they could put all their weather equipment and stuff on it. And we had one that came out of the repair depot and they wanted it ferried over to the East Coast. 